Hello, my name is Dr. Scott Hazelwood, and I am excited to share with you my workshop slide deck and some activities that you can do in your office or at home, wherever you are, about what I learned uh, about motivation comes from video games. I got to present this in CETL as part of our spring workshop series, and I hope that you can find this video helpful and informative. And if you have any questions at all about gamification or anything like that, you can email me at any time. And I would love to talk with you and even work with you to help you design something that you could use in your classroom. Also, I've linked uh, with this presentation two YouTube videos that I think will be very beneficial for you to watch as they sort of give you an overview of what gamification can look like. Uh, one of those videos examines um, how people are encouraged to recycle goods and another video looks at how people are encouraged to take stairs instead of an escalator. Each one is about two or two and a half minutes long and, and they're both very insightful in showing you how we can apply some gaming techniques to what we're already doing in our classrooms. I've also shared with you my folder uh, which has research on gamification and how all of that has worked out. So without further ado, let's dig in. So our goals for today are, talk about, are to talk about motivation, both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, what they are, uh, how they work. We're going to look at what gamification is, how to define it, and then we're going to look at how you can do these things in your course. And it doesn't matter if your course is online, if your course is face-to-face, -face, or if your course is hybrid. All of these different things are involved. So with that, let's look at our first thing to consider. Number one, and this is a, a quote from Seth Godin, if failure is not an option, then neither is success. Our students are growing up uh, playing games in a variety of ways, not just video games, where failure is not necessarily viewed as the end of the game um, or the end of the learning. Failure is a part of the learning process. So what if your students in your class could fail but not be penalized? And in that what I'm talking about is students who are really taking a bold risk, really trying to do something great, but don't quite make the mark, and they quote unquote fail. How can we help our students use those experiences to further learn what it is that you're trying to teach them without penalty? What if they were able to have another go? And so we're going to talk about that as sort of the underlying factor in everything that we look at in this presentation. A little bit about motivation. I think this image is an excellent um, anecdote for what motivation could be. Uh, if there's a better reason to paddle, I don't know what it is. You know, and, and the type says in the picture, sitting in a 3.8 meter sea kayak and watching a 4 meter great white approach you is a fairly tense experience. How are you going to handle that? I would be very motivated at that point in time to paddle as fast as I can. So that's a form of extrinsic motivation. Um, something else is encouraging me to do the work. Uh, there's also intrinsic motivation. So always give 100% unless you're donating blood. But intrinsic motivation is undertaking an activity for its own sake, uh, for the enjoyment, the learning it permits, or the feeding of accomplishment it evokes. And I got that from a book by Carl Cap. He wrote a book called The Gamification of Learning and instruction. Uh, it's a book that the library has. It's very informative and some of the definitions I take from that book for this presentation so that we can uh, sort of remain in the same source. So that's his definition of intrinsic motivation. There's also extrinsic motivation which is behavior undertaken in order to obtain some reward or avoid punishment. So a couple of slides ago the punishment we're avoiding is being eaten by the great white shark. So these are your two types of motivations and you're going to have students are going to fall into one of these categories in your course whether it's going to be intrinsic or extrinsic. They want to be there or they're doing it just to check off something on the box. Um, so keep those two things in mind. And then we're going to look at um, something that Cap also suggests which is a uh, arcs and this goes along with motivation so how can we help our students become motivated in our courses to achieve what we believe in them that they can achieve so arcs 
A stands for the attention. This is the perception, the inquiry, the variability that is offered in your course. The R goes for relevance, so goal orientation, the match motive, the familiarity, the modeling. Uh, C is confidence, so clearly stated learning requirements and expectations for your students. And S is satisfaction, where learners need to feel that this learning has value to them. So if you think back through courses that you've had in the past, um, especially as it comes to all of these different things, the courses that you were more excited about probably achieved more through the ARCS methodology here than the courses that you were not excited about. In those courses that you were not excited about, something was missing. You weren't satisfied or you had no confidence or you didn't see the relevance of it uh, or the attention for you was just not there. So think about this. How can you incorporate ARCS for your students because the goal then is to help our students to become intrinsically motivated learners and we can move them from extrins from extrinsically motivated to intrinsically motivated through arcs this is one way to do that and again arcs is mentioned in the carl m cap game of the gamification of learning and instruction so what is gamification and just as a thought process i'd like for you to um, Find four dice and roll them. And whatever number comes up, define gamification in those four words. No peeking. This is just simply what you think gamification might be. So go ahead and pause the video here and provide your own definition of gamification. So what did you come up with? Gamification is using gaming mechanics, gaming characteristics, gaming fundamentals in non-game situations. This presentation talks a lot about video games. It could just as easily be a variety of board games, from Monopoly to the game of life, um, to Parcheesi, to poker, to Gin Rummy, um, all the way up into all the different video games like Angry Birds or Call of Duty or some of those things. So those mechanics of the games that bring you back you always enjoy playing monopoly with your family why or you always enjoy playing bridge with some of your friends why those are the things that we want to talk about to start incorporating into our classes so why should you consider gamification in your classroom why is this something that's important why is this something that should be considered why even uh, entertain the idea of putting gamification mechanics into your classroom and here's why this is based off of research um, and it's some of its a little bit dated so some of these numbers are going to be bigger now than they were uh, when I was first doing this but over 21 billion dollars in revenue was generated in the United States in 2013 that is a lot of money and there's so much time and so much money in, uh, being devoted to games in the United States that we would be remiss if we didn't consider what it is that we could learn from that industry. Every time a person gets a new video game, the game teaches the user how to play. They have become experts at helping players understand the components and the and the uh, the rules of that game and they do it very quickly so how can we incorporate that into our courses how can we help our students understand the rules of the course understand what they need to do in the course to succeed and have success um, to achieve uh, and to get uh, that quote-unquote reward how can we do that in our courses in a very timely fashion also uh, from from gaming we know that knowledge construction occurs during these games so gamers use what other people have shared with them along the way if you play a game on your phone most likely you have googled how to get through a different level or you've googled how to spell the right word or you've googled different tips and tricks uh, um, and that is just communicating with other people that have played in that game so uh, the largest Wikipedia uh, on the internet is Wikipedia. The largest wiki is Wikipedia. The second largest wiki is the World of Warcraft wiki. Just think about that for just a minute. The two largest online encyclopedias are Wikipedia and World of Warcraft wiki. Why? 
because there's very specific conversations that occur in these places. So if we look at the World of Warcraft wiki, they're having focused conversations in their forums on specific topics. How to improve a character or how to get through a specific uh, issue or a variety of things related. The other thing that happens during these games is that people, users, gamers, with different skills can complement each other. Just like you complement the other faculty in your department, your students complement each other in the classroom. Some of them are going to pick up that material very quickly without issue. Some of them are going to struggle a little bit. Some of them are going to have to practice some on that. So users with different skills can complement each other and they can help each other move through your material in a way that sometimes we don't consider. And players who share different ways to use the skills that have been mastered. For example, uh, one one player may have one way of going about solving a task and a second player may have a completely different way to solve that same task. So put that into your classroom. How can your students work together to achieve the learning that you need them to achieve even though their paths may be just a little bit different? There's also instant feedback. So if you've ever played Angry Birds, uh, there's instant feedback the second you shoot your bird. And if you haven't played Angry Birds, I would encourage you to pause the video right now and download it onto your mobile device just to get an idea of what instant feedback looks like. But when you play Angry Birds, you fling the bird at the pigs. And immediately when you fling the bird, you get feedback. Did you shoot the bird in the right place? Did you shoot it too high? Did you shoot it too low? Did you hit the structure in the correct spot? Do you need to change where you're aiming? Did you kill all the pigs or not? And so all of this feedback comes back to you and you adjust your, your angry bird for the second and third shot. That's what you do. So instant feedback is critical and it's gonna vary in how you would provide instant feedback to your students in all of the different courses. For example, on this page right here, uh, Laura Croft, who is one of my favorite games to play, the Tomb Raider game series. She's saying, if I don't make this jump, the game will be over. Because the feedback from the game says you have to provide the correct jump. So how does that work? You get just-in-time delivery of information that helps the learning occur. And you give good feedback to your students. And the feedback is critical. That's when you gain the most as a game player and as a learner. And these feedback loops uh, are based on the decision that uh, the players make. So remember, in your courses, you are the content expert. You are the one that knows where you need to get your students to. So let your students have some freedom in some of the choices that they make. And you can provide the nudge and the feedback, and you can, you can guide them towards that learning that you need them to demonstrate to you. The, the uh, other thing of games is that goals are very clearly stated all through games. Games that you play, the goals are clearly stated. If you're playing Angry Birds, which I have referred to a couple of times, the goal is to pop all the pigs. If you're playing Monopoly with your friends, the goal is to become a uh, slumlord and own as many properties and hotels as possible. If the goal is uh, if you're playing poker with your your buddies, the goal is to win the most poker chips that night. And it just depends on what your game is. But any game that you play, there is always a clearly stated goal that needs to be accomplished in order for you to know that you are successful in that game. So make sure that when you're teaching your courses, there is a very clearly stated goal that your students need to achieve in order to successfully navigate your course. There's also a lot of communication inside of the games themselves. I challenge you to find a teenager who is playing a game and is doing so socially uh, through the Xbox or through a PlayStation or even on their phone. They talk a lot when they play these games and they give each other a hard time and they communicate with each other about what to do and how to do it. Um, and there's a lot of give and take and a lot of conversation about helping each other better master their game. Games are extremely social and, and there is so many uh, idea exchanges that occur. It's incredible. Just from my own house when my kids play games, one of the games that the kids all really enjoy playing together is the Call of Duty Zombies games. 
and I have three kids. They're all three different kids. They do. They have completely different interests. But when they play zombies together, their conversations are very focused. They uh, are helping each other out. They're fussing each other if they're not holding up their end of the. You know, if somebody's not holding up their end of the deal. They're encouraging each other to try different things, and and they're trading ideas on how to use different weapons, different places to go explore, and different things to do inside of that game. And and sometimes they argue ab about how to do that, but a lot of times they don't. They're just talking about how to go through this thing. So can you create that environment in your course? Humans are social people in general. So how can you create that social atmosphere where ideas and communication become a part of your class and dialogue? 